Stephen Hicks, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. If you don't mind, just for the audience, giving a little bit of a background about yourself to start off, that'd be awesome. Well, I'm a professor of philosophy at Rockford University in uh, Illinois in the United States, born in uh, Canada in, uh, in Toronto and grew up in Canada, came to the States for, for grad school when I uh, decided uh, a little bit late to get serious about philosophy mm -hmm. as, a, uh, as a possible career. And uh, so I've, I've uh, been here ever since. Uh, yeah, I love philosophy. Uh, philosophy is, in effect, the uh, the mother discipline, yep. and so that, uh, you know, for someone who's a little bit interested in everything, it's uh, an ideal platform to be able to read and teach and think about whatever one wants. So here I am. I should look into that. I uh, I'm a little bit interested in everything. I like to say I like, know a little bit about a lot, but I'm sure you probably know a lot about a lot. And what is it? What is it? What does it a little mean head to... start on you? <laughs> yeah, I think so. What does it mean to be a modern day philosopher? Seems like something you don't really normally associate with the modern world. Mm. Well, it's uh, I think uh, it's the same as it always has been. And in one way, being a philosopher is not any different than being a thoughtful human being. You know, as uh, as human beings, we you know we have a, a big brain. And uh, uh, of course, whether we use it actively or not is a matter of choice and 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 commitment and ongoing ongoing decision. But uh, to be a human being is to think about what matters in your your life. What uh, what are your top goals going to be in your life, particularly when you are a younger person? Uh, what kind of person do I want to be? And then, uh, you know, uh, hopefully, working on yourself to develop yourself into the kind of person who can uh, achieve the, the big goals that one sets for in one's life. And then, of course, we think about life uh, uh, more broadly than that. We ask, well, is this life the only life, for example? Is there an afterlife? And in that afterlife, are there gods or a god? And what relationship does that have to this life? Uh, uh, and so on. So uh, inescapably, I think, uh, uh, to the extent one is using one's mind, one becomes a philosopher or at least philosophical about one's life. So to be a professional philosopher, whether one's an academic or not, is a, is a, a, a sub-issue. One then is uh, systematically thinking about those issues. But since the issues are all uh, complicated and in many cases they're abstract, and there's also a history of good answers and a history of weird answers. There's always arguments about everything. So a certain amount of being a professional philosopher then is uh, engaging the uh, engaging the arguments, particularly the arguments that have been laid out and the positions that have been staked out by the the, you know, the great genius philosophers across history. Hmm. And is there any moments that you can remember where you've had like a put the book down and just sigh wow moment? I mean, I've had a few of those hmm. when you read the Bible, for example, there's a few of those moments when you read uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. I had a few of those moments what are those moments for you and who are the authors that really, mm. really make you say, wow? Well, uh, fortunately, they they happen a lot. Um, uh, one of the things now that we've been doing philosophy systematically in the Western tradition, there's some argument about this uh, for perhaps 2,600 years is the number of great geniuses who have been uh, 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 doing philosophy across that time. So you mentioned Aurelius, uh, for, for example. But uh, uh, when one uh, engages with these philosophers, uh, there are going to be lots of those wow moments. And sometimes it's because uh, you know, they are, are, are articulating a position that you had never thought of before, mm -hmm. and suddenly you realize this is uh, something I need to think about. Sometimes it's a matter of being challenged on something that you thought was on pretty safe ground or pretty uh, pretty obvious, but you realize, well, maybe maybe not. So you have that that poise moment. Sometimes it's a matter of something uh, being so beautifully said or poignantly said mm -hmm. that uh, that one uh, uh, just, uh, appreciates what is said and how it says. And so there's a an aesthetic component that's uh, that's added in there as well. Um, so uh, that happens uh, fairly fairly frequently, I would say, if one is if one is doing philosophy well. 
of course, one of the occupational hazards is, uh, particularly if one is a professor, uh, you know, unfortunately, many professors just end up teaching the same course over and over again. So the the wow moments decline from their from their earlier years. But if one really is a lifelong learner and always thinking about issues uh, and keeping up on the the literature, uh, uh, it's a it really is a wonderful way of uh, of keeping oneself fresh. Mm. So uh, here I am, decades later, and still still enjoying it. That's fantastic. And I remember I was watching the I was just watching Gladiator a few nights actually. A few nights ago, actually, and uh, mm. there was one line where he says, "Everything you do now will echo into eternity." I love that line. And another one that mm. he said was, "Death smiles upon us all. All we can do is, as a man, is smile back." So, some mm. great lines in that. And just before we get onto postmodernism, do you mind just for the for the people like myself who aren't overly learned about philosophy, what's mm. a good place that what's a few good, a good place to start? Like a few really good books where somebody mm. can come and understand some very deep concepts and then go from there? Yes. Well, <clears throat> so the, the thing, truth, I'll, I'll do it this uh, autobiographically. So uh, when I started university, I didn't know what philosophy was. I was you know, a kid. I, I liked sports and girls and uh, all kinds of things like that. And I always read a lot. I had no conception of philosophy as a as a as a as a discipline. So, when I went off to university, I would say two things. One was uh, uh, I had a course that was taught not actually in the philosophy department. It was taught in the political science department, but by a very uh, philosophical political theorist. Uh, he had come out of the University of Chicago, which is one of the great uh, humanities institutions of the world. Uh, for the last uh, last several generations. And on top of that, he was a very dynamic lecturer. And so he was uh, marching us in a sense through the major modern political philosophers, you know, starting from Machiavelli to John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and Rousseau and mm -hmm. Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, and so on. And so uh, it was partly through the dynamism of his teaching that he was making these great minds come alive that I uh, had a conception of uh, these issues are, are are very interesting to me. What, what I was finding was that all of these were uh, billed as political philosophers. What was really interesting to me, as I guess then a 19-year-old kid, was uh, how one's political views often turn on one's moral views. So mm -hmm. what you think the government ought to do depends on what you think one ought to do. You know, so... What are the really important things that governments ought to be protecting or advancing, but that requires a moral theory. And what you think is good for human beings in turn depends on well, what do you think human beings are? What are their capacities? Yeah. What are their potential developments? So you need to have a theory of human nature and that takes you into biology and psychology and possibly religion and issues of whether we have a soul. So it was all of those underlying issues that uh, I found myself fascinated with and starting to realize that politics, which I was also interested in to some extent, is downstream from, from those. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, that was one thing. So what I would uh, say, the, the action item then is uh, if you're a young person going off to university, uh, do some you know, little shopping around, get plugged into the student grapevine and find out who are the the really dynamic, interesting, you know, sexy professors, because they're going to bring whatever it is alive that they are teaching uh, uh, alive. The thing I would uh, I recommend as a great starting point, in, and this is uh, also partly autobiographical, is uh, uh, the book Atlas Shrugged by mm -hmm. Ayn Rand, which, uh, you know, Rand is a brilliant novelist. He's also a brilliant philosopher. And so I found it uh, captivating for me this, uh, in effect, dramatization of any number of philosophical issues. And so I was reading Atlas Shrugged in my first year of university simultaneously with taking this course. And uh, so the, the story engaged me, the philosophical issues that she was dramatizing engaged me. And then I remember when I finished that or shrugged, it was about the time I finished that course. And then it came to my mind, ah, this is what philosophy is. Mm -hmm. So that time I was just taking a bunch of different courses out of interest, but uh, that was the moment I said, okay, I'm going to come back and uh, major effectively in philosophy because uh, I want to uh, I want to do this more. Mm. And you've written a book about Ayn Rand, haven't you? 
Uh, not a book. I've written several uh, journal articles uh, on aspects of Rand's philosophy. Mm. I've uh, had de formal public debates about Rand's philosophy. And I've, uh, um, uh, at the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is one of the major kind of online resources where they have articles on philosophy and philosophers A through Z, I wrote the entry on uh, Ayn Rand. So that might be a good, uh, hmm. good starting point as well. But Atlas Shrugged is... Uh, is a great book. Obviously, it's extraordinarily provocative, yeah. but that's one of the beautiful things about philosophy and philosophers. You want them to push your buttons at a very deep level to, uh, to additional incentive to really think through what matters. And one of the things that is another one that's pr provocative these days, and certainly one that pushes buttons, uh, pushes my buttons at times, is postmodernism. And it's something mm. that you've become obviously quite an expert in over your time and having written postmodernism explained uh yeah. it's a great book and it's a great explanation of it all do you mind just for the audience watching and it's an idea that i talk about quite regularly on the channel it's something that people are interested in and then i think it's also something that once you understand it a little bit better you can kind of see it everywhere in mm. today's culture so what is postmodernism yeah all right so that's that's a huge one uh, the way I like to, at the introductory level, think about philosophy is obviously there's lots of different philosophies out there, and mm -hmm. uh, it's good to become exposed to all of them. But in my judgment, uh, philosophical debates boil down to almost always three-way debates. On any major philosophical issue, there's three positions that you have to grapple with. So one of the things to be aware of when you're beginning is uh, people who will force you into dichotomy, saying there's either this or you're that. Uh, in many cases, that leaves out the important third option. So one way to think about uh, postmodernism is to say, historically, there have been philosophies articulated that are, let's, let's say, religion friendly. That is to say, they're going to emphasize, you know, that there is the natural world, but more importantly, beyond the natural world is a supernatural world. Mm -hmm. And that has God or gods, and God created the world, they govern the world, and we owe our obligations to that world. Often, more religion-friendly philosophies uh, run into knowledge challenges where you can't, you know, you can't see the gods, taste them, smell them. The arguments for the existence of the gods are, are often seen as weak. So mm. often, not exclusively, religious philosophies tend then to emphasize faith or seeking revelations or mystical experience or trusting in tradition. Uh, they typically also will de-emphasize materialistic pursuits. You know, I'm not interested in money. Uh, maybe if I'm going to uh, uh, be go a good person, I will keep myself sexually pure, so I will embrace a life of poverty and chastity and obedience and so on. So, now that is uh, to, to push religious philosophy in a certain direction, but there's a package of philosophical positions that religions take, and there are variations within them. Now, another prominent kind of philosophy, uh, again, uh, in an introductory way, as I say, is a more science-friendly philosophy. And what science-friendly philosophies will do is to say, we're going to take the natural world seriously, and we're going to be more skeptical about, you know, we don't believe in ghosts and goblins and gremlins and gods and angels and all of that spooky stuff. We don't think that's real. Maybe, you know, if you push us, you'd be able to come up with a really good argument to get us to believe it. But what we know is the natural world, it works according to cause and effect. We sense it. We systematize our sensations and our perceptions of the world in the data. We do experiments. We do logic. We do math. And the whole goal of all of this is so that we as uh, natural beings who live in this physical world, we can live a better life. Uh, uh, you know, and so we want to be happy and flourishing in this world. And so there's then this long-standing debate between more religious-oriented philosophies and more science-oriented philosophies. And that's one of the great dichotomies. Now, the third position, though, is, and this has always been a contender, sometimes a minority position in some cultures, sometimes a majority position in cultures, which is to say 
a plague on both of your houses. Right? So, and this is the position that is going to be philosophically cynical and skeptical and pessimistic about everything. So, for example, uh, uh, this is the position that will say, well, you religious people think that religion provides all of the answers to life, and you science people think that science provides all of the answers to life, but there are no answers. Nobody really knows anything, and so you embrace a kind of skepticism. Or you religious people will say your goal is to achieve salvation and to achieve, so to speak, the good life in the afterlife, uh, to be reunited with the gods in heaven or to go to Valhalla or, or whatever. And you more science and naturalistically oriented people will say your goal is to live uh, you know, healthily and to live a long time and to enjoy you know, uh, 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 you know, meaningful relationships and build your career and have a great sex life and die, uh, as we are eventually going to do, but die, you know, having no regrets and feeling satisfaction with what you have accomplished with your, with your life. But then, of course, the third position is going to say, well, you guys are both optimistic in some ultimate value sense, but the truth is that everything is ultimately shit, everything is ultimately mm -hmm. empty, uh, there is no true love. There is no happy ever after story. Everything that you build is eventually going to crumble. And so ultimately, some sort of value nihilism mm -hmm. is uh, is going to going to result re result from this. So uh, to come back then to your question about modernism or and or sorry, postmodernism, like uh, the, the way to look at this historically then is to say, in the pre-modern world, basically, uh, if we take, uh, from say 400 or 500 uh, uh, years after the death of Christ, or four or 500 years after the Roman Republic stopped being a republic and became an imperium. Rome is declining. We are getting into the medieval era. Uh, and uh, again, there's controversies here. Things uh, slayed into the Dark Ages for about 500 years. But during that medieval era of 1,000 years in Western history, it was religious philosophy that was dominant. More particularly in the West, it was Christian philosophy, sometimes married with uh, some of the ancient Greek schools, sometimes incorporating a little bit of Stoicism. But essentially, it was an otherworldly, supernaturalistic, uh, authoritarian institution. We are valorizing priests and monks and nuns who commit to poverty and obedience and chastity. Life expectancies are short, and everybody is hoping ultimately for salvation in the other world. Now, again, that's overstating it, but that is the dominant philosophical framework for a thousand years. As we get into the modern world, starting about 500 years ago, that religious philosophy is challenged first by more worldly uh, people who want to explore the world. Uh, so Columbus crosses the ocean and suddenly everybody's aware that there are all of these cultures out there. And some of them are doing some pretty amazing things and they're not uh, believers in our religion. How is this possible? Some of them are influenced by uh, a rediscovery of many of the Greek and Roman classics. And they're amazed at what the Greeks and the Romans were able to accomplish. And they weren't particularly religious, much less Christian. So how could these pagan, often naturalistic civilizations accomplish such great things? Mm. Uh, the early scientists uh, are, are starting to study the human body, starting to come up with more naturalistic understanding of the way the heavens move. And we start not really calling the heavens anymore. We call it the galaxy, or we start to call it the solar system after Copernicus and Galileo and so on. So we have the rise then of naturalistic science and a much more humanistic understanding of what human beings can and should be doing. And so uh, one of the great success stories then is the rise of kind of humanistic individualism and science and technology in the modern world. And so that is essentially modernistic philosophy. Now, what we find then in postmodernism is that in the last two generations, I would say, maybe three generations, uh, depending on, you know, we can have these arguments about where you want to put the, uh, the flag being planted, 
uh, is then a strongly skeptical challenge to both the religious philosophical inheritance and the scientific philosophical inheritance. What you find in the middle part of the 20th century is philosophy is at a very skeptical phase. Hmm. Uh, its major uh, programs, both in religious philosophy and in more naturalistic, science-friendly philosophy, they seem to have reached dead ends. Uh, uh, the, the balloons, uh, as the postmodernists would put it, have been punctured. And it's not clear that what's going to replace them, or even if it's possible to replace those with anything. So what you find is the rise in the last two generations of very skeptical, uh, adversarial, cynical, pessimistic philosophy. And at its core, that's what the postmodern movement is all about. I find it really interesting how you laid that out at the start there, the three different lines of philosophy. Mm. And when I look at them, I look at the more cynical philosophy and I think to myself, why would anybody want to think like that? Why mm. would anybody want to think that way? So, I mean, I guess I would ask you, why would anybody want to think like that? Well, I think one can get there two ways. I think sometimes, of course, people, when they start becoming more philosophical, typically as young people, they are damaged already in various ways. Uh, um, you know, the, you know the, the stereotype about the alienated teenager, you know, it's a, it's a stereotype for, for a reason. Or the, the rebellious teenager who uh, you know, wants to tear all of the, the so-called accomplishments of the parents' generation down. And sometimes uh, teenagers have very good reasons for, 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 for doing so. Uh, you know, they're still young people. Maybe they have been raised in abusive households right, or intellectually and emotionally oppressive households. And so they're going through a rebellious phase. So the point then here is that sometimes people are, by the time they start doing philosophy, psychologically already predisposed to arguments that are pessimistic and cynical and jaded and so forth. And so the philosophy then is an affirmation already of where they are psychologically. Mm. And I know this from you know personal experience, many uh, uh, of my you know, uh, fellow students as undergraduates and, and, and graduate students, you know, they were all smart people, but it was quite clear that they were coming in with, with some baggage and in some cases outright damage. And in many cases, philosophy was a matter of uh, 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 rationalizing or providing a framework within which their personal psychological sense of what was real mm -hmm. is then going to be articulated. But sometimes, of course, people don't be, or become po postmodernists, not because they, they want to, to become postmodernists, but because they get argued into postmodernism. And one of the things that, of course, can happen is one can start off as a young per person and, say, be raised in a religious family. And from your perspective, you know, the, the religion seems like a reasonable, decent way of looking at the world. Or maybe you were raised in a more scientifically, naturalistically minded, and your parents were decent people, and you've got some healthy, healthy goals, and it seems like science is doing some great things. And so all of that uh, approach to uh, uh, life uh, seems philosophically reasonable to mm. you. But then what can happen, and a good philosophy of education is going to include some of that, is going to be what are all of the good skeptical arguments against religion? What are all the good skeptical arguments about against science and scientific method? What are the good skeptical uh, arguments against the idea that there are objective moral truths, right? Or that we can build a win-win set of social relations. And so part of what uh, a philosophy education can do, in effect, is undermine any positive philosophical position white one might have been inclined to by the time one uh, gets to university. And to the extent that you're a smart person, you follow the arguments and you let the logic lead you where it goes, you can end up in the, the position uh, quite honestly to say, wow, I guess we don't know anything. Right? I guess there are no values. I guess uh, the, there are no genuine relationships among human beings. There is no point to life. And then so then one will be uh, 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 significantly on the road to a, a postmodern framework 
uh, so and that's not because you started wanting to get there, but that's where the logic of what you have learned uh, mm. seems reasonable to you. And this is where it gets interesting because one of, obviously one of the fundamental premises of postmodernism is that there aren't any universal truths. And like you say, there is no grander meaning to life. We're all atoms just bumping into each other, basically. Um, so what is the argument against that? Why mm. are there universal truths? And what are universal truths? And how do we know yeah. if, if what they are? Well, uh, uh, one fun way to start with the response to that is to say, to say that there are no universal truths is already a universal truth. And right? so if you say there are no answers, that's already to give an answer. Right? If you say nobody knows anything, well, you are making a knowledge claim. You mm. claim that nobody, in fact, knows anything. It's a fundamental so fallacy of, of postmodernism in itself. It's a, well, making so, a claim. Yes. So, uh, so that uh, can get you a certain amount of mileage. So then that turns then to the issue, well, how can I even, uh, you know, without contradicting myself, articulate a skeptical position? You know, if, if I say, I am certain that there are no certainties, or I know that there is no knowledge, uh, uh, how, can I, how can I even do so? Now, in many cases, what postmoderns will do is they will say, okay, yeah, I recognize that point. Uh, I am contradicting myself, but contradicting myself, it's only going to be a problem if I think that logical contradiction is a problem. And I'm only going to think that logical contradiction is a problem if I think that logic uh, is an important thing. Hmm. But what if I'm skeptical about logic? And then this is then typically what postmoderns will do is to say, I'm not going to accept that I have to be logical. Instead, I am just using language. I'm using words for rhetorical purposes. I believe everybody just has their subjective value agendas. And so, uh, you know, if I give you a logical argument and it works on you, fine. If I give you an illogical argument or logic or a, a pair of arguments that have tensions and contradictions and that works on you, that's also fine because everything really is just a power game. And I'm just playing the power game, right? And, and so on. So if you come back with that kind of, well, you're, you're refuting yourself uh, self-contradictorily, then say, okay, fine. Then I will just try some sort of other, other rhetorical, rhetorical strategy. So then uh, immediately what one needs to do though, uh, this is more seriously, is to get into the kinds of arguments that lead people to uh, skeptical conclusions. So what you have to do if you want to say, for example, that there is something to scientific method, not necessarily that it always gives us certainty, although I would argue sometimes it does, uh, that it not that it always gives us absolute knowledge, though sometimes it does. Uh, but then what you need to do is go through all of the important elements in in uh, uh, in cognition and show that how science integrates those into a significant package uh, is, is legitimate. So if science begins with observation of the world to say, well, our senses are putting us in contact with the world, that when we are perceiving the world, we are actually perceiving objects and their actions and their relations and so forth. So you need to have a, 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 an articulate defense of sense perception. We also, though, as human beings, uh, uh, seem to rise above most of the animal species in also forming abstractions. We form concepts. So, you know, I'm a man and you're a man, but you, know, you are a unique man and I'm a unique man. But at the same time, we share this more abstract manness. We say we're both equally men, even though particularly we are different. Well, there can be puzzles about how we form these abstract concepts and what are we referring to when we have these abstract concepts? Uh, and then on the base, we go on to form propositions where we string numbers of concepts together. You know, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog and ran off into the woods. Yeah. Well, that's like a whole bunch of concepts and, and it is cognitively meaningful to us. And we're picking out a whole bunch of stuff that's going on out there in reality. Uh, and so how do we do that though? And then we take all of these propositions and we start formulating them into stories. Uh, uh, you know, we tell historical narratives or we tell fictional narratives. And those narratives are significant and meaningful 
to us? Well, uh, how can a narrative about uh, long dead historical figures have meaning to us in the contemporary world? Uh, or fictional stories, why, what makes them cry and uh, or us cry or laugh or feel, you know, this is telling me something important about my life. You know, where does this power of narratives come from? And then when as scientists, we put together like huge numbers of propositions, we've got these complicated theories about the way the world works. And we're using logic and mathematics to uh, to to defend all of them and to, and to argue. Well, where does this logic come from? Where does the math come from? The point just is then, if we are going to respond to postmodernism, the postmoderns come at the end of a long set of philosophical arguments that say, well, sense perception is crap. Hmm. Concept formation and abstractions are crap. Right? Narratives are just subjective stringings together. Logic is a subjective construction. Mathematics isn't mm. based on anything. So they've undercut all of that. So what we then need to do is have better positive theories of all of those things. Now, we're not going to do that in this, uh, this program here. But uh, one thing I would say is, uh, uh, take a, uh, for anybody, of course, take a serious look at the arguments that the postmodernists are are, are, are advancing, take those arguments seriously. At the same time, of course, look at science and technology and uh, see what, in fact, all of those tools have, in fact, done for us, taking observation and abstraction and logic and mathematics and experimentation seriously and uh, you know, investigate those tools well and compare the two of them. The other thing I would say is uh, uh, just be mindful that the human mind then the human brain, brain mind, is an extraordinarily complicated, powerful tool, and we are still at the very beginnings of learning to figure out how that works. So, mm -hmm. if we take neuroscience and our understanding of the brain, how many generations have we been doing serious neuroscience? Just a few. More complicatedly, psychology as a science is uh, perhaps a little over one century old. Mm. And so what we have then is this extraordinarily complicated tool, and we are still at the beginnings of figuring out how all of it works. But in many cases, the skeptical positions about how senses work, how our memories work, how logic works, and so forth, that many of those arguments were formulated one, two, three, four centuries ago, uh, back when we basically were pre-neuroscience pre-scientific psychology. There, you know, there were very primitive understandings about how the nervous system, how the brain works, how our psychological apparatus works. And of course, it's very easy to poke holes in uh, and be skeptical about uh, often pr uh, primitive psychological and neuroscientific theory. So I would just say it's an open research project. Do take the skeptical argument seriously, but do also look at the important contributions and actual accomplishments of, of science and uh, uh, get oneself up to speed before making any uh, diet and diet and uh, diet in the wool conclusions. Mm. I think one of the things that's also interesting about it, though, is that a lot of these people, the postponents of the past and present, they're not stupid. And some, sometimes when I listen to what they say, you do think that they're really so they're onto something in some ways. And no, I, wonder, I wonder where you give credit to or where you give credence to the ideas that they bring up, because obviously mm -hmm. it's not good to just form a binary around everything. And like you said at the start of the interview, actually, that one it's just one way or another and, and then that's it. So is there is there places where you say, okay, they're onto something here. We should actually maybe look into this a little bit more. And then is there a place where you think that the ideas actually go off the edge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. I will be both complementary and uncomplimentary to postmodernism as a, as a school. So you mentioned my book, Explaining Postmodernism, and what I'm doing in that book is talking in the modern world how there was a reaction against reason, naturalism, and so forth, that uh, over the course of many uh, generations of philosophical development led into postmodernism. And all of that is working out by people who are brilliant. Right? The, 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 the names that we still argue about in the history of philosophy, you know, Immanuel Kant and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Friedrich Nietzsche and Karl Marx and the others, 
they are uh, giants in the pantheon for a a reason uh and and we all need to to know their their know their views even if uh in my view all of them are fundamentally wrong i would extend that also to the first generation of uh postmoderns and so the ones i cover in my book are michel foucault Jacques Derrida, uh, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, Richard Rorty. Uh, all of these are brilliant guys uh, doing their writings in the late 50s, 1960s, on into the 1970s. And they are, uh, all of them, PhDs in philosophy, PhDs in philosophy from top schools. And uh, they are... Uh, uh, names that we all know and need to engage with for a reason. So they're not stupid, even though I are, would argue that they are all fundamentally wrong, because yep. what makes them all postmoderns is they buy into the uh, the best skeptical arguments that have been developed, and then reach the conclusion that those skeptical arguments are unanswerable, and then ask the what next question. And uh, so what what do we do if we think reason is is crap if we don't know anything about the world if there are no truths if there are no certainties and so the postmodern project comes out of comes out of that so i i would say i think they're wrong but they're not stupid and uh, any intellectual needs to engage with uh, with their with their arguments uh, where i though will become less complimentary though is that i think postmodernism has declined as an intellectual movement over the last two generations since Foucault, Rorty, Derrida, and so on. So I'm not at all impressed. Uh, there's a certain amount of cleverness. Right? You, you've got to be clever to get your PhD in, in whatever discipline uh, uh, and then to get a faculty appointment and to get published and so on. So there's going to be a certain, but I'm not seeing the level of originality or even the level of brilliance. And I think that's built into the postmodern project because if, for example, you reach a skeptical conclusion, a deeply skeptical conclusion, as postmodernism does, you know, that there are no truths, that it's pointless to be logical and to learn mathematics and scientific method. If when you are 22 years old, you reach that as a conclusion, your intellectual development is going to stop. Yeah. Because you're not going to try very hard to be rational, to learn more logic, to learn more math, to learn more science. You will put a bracket around all of that and say, okay, I'm going to be non-logical, non-rational, right, non-scientific, whatever that means. And so you are not going to develop. Also, if as a matter of postmodernism, if you say, uh, well, you know, there is no way for us really to understand each other because everyone is trapped in their own subjective narratives. And sometimes those subjective narratives are race-based or gender-based or ethnically based right and so we get all of this you know white uh, eurocentric male type of language if that's how you start to think of people and then you start to think of people as identity politics does which is really a theory about what human identity is locked into these different uh, epistemologies or these different cognitive styles and they can't really communicate past those group subjective well then you're not going to try very hard to understand where people from some other position uh, is coming from and to the extent that you don't try very hard you just stay within the boundaries of whatever it is that you already happen to believe you also though are going to then say well you know, what, what possibility do I have if I'm, you know, say, coming of intellectual age in the 21st century of understanding 17th century French people <laughs> or third century BC Greek people, right? Or Japanese philosophers of the Tokugawa era, right? All of those are going to be, from the postmodern perspective, completely alien cognitive cultures completely alien value cultures there's no way for me to understand them so i'm not at all going to be interested in history Their history becomes to be pointless there are no universal truths and cause and effect principles that we can learn from history history starts to become very pointless and this is in part why uh, when you read the postmoderns uh, in the journals that are all very presentist they're just talking about current issues, current politics, current cultural matters, and so forth. 
Uh, but then to the extent, though, that you do that as a young person, if you reach this postmodern conclusion that not every other culture other than mine is cut off from me, and the entire past traditions are cut off from me, well, again, your intellectual development is going to be stultified. You will never seriously engage with Descartes, with John Locke, with Aristotle, with Thomas Aquinas, because you are believing that that is pointless. Hmm. So what I think has happened is that postmodernism started off with some brilliant skeptics, hmm. brilliant relativists, but it has institutionalized a kind of decline. You know, sadly, you know, I dip into uh, postmodern journals and, uh, you know, browse a postmodern book at the bookstore once in a while. But the, you know, the 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 sad thing, and it's in, a, in its way, it's an embarrassing thing, is you know, you 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 read the first page of it, and you say, you know, I already read this twenty five years ago. Uh, you know, there's nothing new here. It's just a retreading of the same the same intellectual tropes, and that's always then a sign of a movement in decline, in intellectual decline. Now, that is to emphasize the intellectual decline. I do think that postmodernism has been very successful, though. At uh, to some extent, uh, you know, using the colonizing language, mm -hmm. colonizing significant portions of higher education, colonizing some education schools, some law schools, some of the professional programs, and then uh, spreading out into the more popular culture. Mm -hmm. It's really probably for the last, I guess, now eight years, since about 2015 or so, you know, suddenly everybody is aware that uh, uh, there is this thing called postmodernism mm -hmm. and it has uh, various guises as political correctness, wokeness, this, that, and the other thing. But suddenly we are aware it's not just uh, a kind of strange intellectual movement inside the ivory tower. It is uh, taking over the culture. So postmodernism is still quite active and vigorous culturally, but I think it's inert intellectually. Mm. It's fascinating when you when you look at it because you see it play out quite a bit in today's culture. And I'm interested to know what you think about this in terms of how we're seeing it and some of the more damaging effects that you think that these ideas are having, or at least to the extent to which they're playing that part. And also, you talk a lot about uh, resentment. And I've talked I've I've heard you talk about resentment and the Nietzschean idea of resentment. If I said that right, probably butchered it. <laughs> but, enough. But do you think that uh, that this is an idea that feeds on resentment, or at least that mm. that that attracts maybe people who are a little bit more inclined towards those sorts of yeah. philosophical I leanings? Can, I think it can go both ways. I think you can get by the time people are intellectually coming of age and they're starting to think about big things in a in a principled way, if they already have a kind of resentment psychology. And there are lots of ways in which people can uh, you know, be damaged uh, as, as young people, mm -hmm. and uh, resentment and envy seems to be a, a legitimate uh, psychological framework to, to adopt. And in those cases, again, postmodernism will be attractive to them because it will justify and rationalize their resentment. But I do think it can go the other way. I think it can take... Mm who are basically healthy psychologically uh, you know they want to do something with their lives but they get in the hands of wrong uh, wrong professors who are articulate and uh, uh, those professors then damage them psychologically and then people change their change their mind so you know I don't have the the data on this but you know anecdotally anybody who hangs out in in uh, in higher education, you know, there's lots of, you know, fresh faced, eager, optimistic young people who arrive at this time of year on college campus. And, uh, you know, by the time they are juniors to uh, two or three years later, you know, the, they have you know, weird hair, multiple piercings. Uh, mm. They don't bathe anymore. And, you know, their face is just I hate the world. Uh, so something has happened in those in those two years. Uh, and so I think that is the, the product of of the education. So, um, but where the damage uh, occurs, I think the first damage has come uh, at the higher education level, because that's where postmodernism was, was first. And so it uh, you know, damaged a number of people who otherwise would have gone on to become uh, you know, healthy, 
uh, uh, people in their personal lives, but contributors to science and engineering and building entrepreneurial businesses and going on and doing wonderful things in the arts and convincing them that uh, everything is pointless uh, uh, and uh, just to, to, uh, to underachieve uh, or even to become active saboteurs of mm -hmm. other people's positive creative projects. So there's a significant amount of damage that has happened there. I think uh, to the extent that starting in the 1990s is when I was noticing it, when I was um, uh, uh, teaching philosophy of education and following the education journals more closely, postmodernism started to leave the high academic uh, space and started to, because uh, you know, quite reasonably they're saying if we want to be ambitious with our postmodernism, we have to get into the other schools, but to get into the other schools, first, we need to retrain the teacher. So we need to do something in in uh, in the education schools. And so they were quite successful in uh, uh, the 1990s and on into the 2000s in uh, revamping how teachers were trained mm. uh, and then the certifications that are that are necessary. And so that's why now in one uh, aspect of the culture wars, we're seeing parents and other people who care about their children's education, you know, distressed and, and, and starting to get up to speed and fighting back against some of the craziness that's going on uh, uh, inside uh, you know, primary schools, middle schools and, and, and high schools. So all of that is, uh, is damaging. The first damage there is uh, the crippling of kids' cognitive development. Because again, if you're a postmodernist, you're not going to really <clears throat> be interested in keep teaching kids to look at both sides of an argument, to learn a lot about history, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to, to think optimistically that you can, in fact, uh, understand the world from alien, philosophical, cultural, religious frameworks, uh, uh, you know, to learn logic and math and reading and writing. And so we've seen you know, the scores decline and results decline in, in all of those areas. So that cognitive, cognitive, uh, uh, um, damage is uh, is very real. Mm. Uh, the other thing is uh, that obviously to the extent that they are teaching not uh, the idea that there are universal truths, you know, certain like universal moral truths, like you know, that all human beings have uh, dignity, all human beings have the right to life and liberty in the pursuit of happiness, uh, uh, that uh, under the under the skin, you know, human beings, their character is the thing that matters most, as Martin Luther King said, mm. or that we should, as a universal principle, uh, not only have equal liberties, but equality before the law in all ways. And all of those are universal principles. And that, uh, you know, maybe in some context, race matters and ethnicity matters and, and sex and gender matter. But more fundamentally, there is a universal humanity and a set of universal moral codes that uh, should be should be adopted to the extent that we abandon that and we say that people are locked into uh, different ethnicities different uh, races different genders and those are all in conflict with each other and we don't have any recourse to reason and logic to settle our differences then of course uh, to the extent that you would teach young people from an early age that you're just setting them some up for uh, for a life of conflict and isolation from uh, from other groups, and that's obviously undercutting the huge progress. Uh, and this is partly why I'm optimistic. We have, in fact, mm. made progress progress against you know, traditional racism, traditional sexism, traditional ethnocentrism, and so on. You know, the, the modern Enlightenment project has been a great success. But we are starting to see uh, signs of the damage that uh, postmodernism uh, is uh, is doing against that progress. So that's a, a long answer to your your question about where I see the damage. Mm, no, I, I really enjoy hearing the long answer because I think myself, I'm a baby compared to you in terms of understanding these ideas. So I tend to look around at the world sometimes, and I think I get like alarmed by it. I see not only do people not really respect the ideas of truth and the ideas of tradition, but they, it appears to me as though people are actively looking to spit in the face of it sometimes. 
and yeah, absolutely yeah. art as well. I, I've I've seen you do a lecture about uh, art and the uglification of art, mm -hmm. and I also look at that with architecture and even literature. Everything is becoming ugly, and then people as well. Uh, it's who are you to tell me what's beautiful? Who are you to tell me what's objectively beautiful? I'm going to dye my hair purple and put eight nose rings in. And if you don't think I'm beautiful, then it's just your right, subjective sure. opinion. And I look at these yeah, things right. and when I, when I, I can I, do, uh, yeah. you know, I can be obese and have uh, you know, exactly. self imposed uh, you know, bodily disfigurements. Uh, but all of that, of course, you know, beauty is a very complicated aesthetic standard. And exactly. again, you need to have a fairly sophisticated. Uh, understanding of human psychology uh, in order to properly ground any sort of objectivist or universalistic understanding of what what beauty is. And so uh, just like any uh, uh, you know objective understanding or universal understanding of moral principles, aesthetic standards are also going to be undermined by the postmodern the postmodern project. Now to come back to your point about uh, about resentment, there's an interesting uh, point here, especially in the in the context of of, of art, uh, where sometimes we see this more nakedly. Some of the people who are most anti-art, uh, you know, we're, we're aware of the uh, the people who say they're motivated by environmental concerns, but they will go in and destroy mm -hmm. works of art. Yeah. And you know, it's not accidental why they are destroying works of art. It's not, you know, it's a kind of publicity stunt. But there are lots of ways, lots of things you can destroy, right? Uh, you know, and interestingly, you know, when the Taliban, uh, you know, twenty years ago was destroying works of art, it's never accidental why they go for the things that are beautiful and have spoken to all kinds of human beings across <laughs> the ages and across ethnic and relate, racial and, and, and religious boundaries. It's a form of nihilism, right, where you want to destroy anything that has integrity, mm -hmm. anything that has beauty, anything that brings pleasure to other people. And to the extent that you do that, you are saying something about the state of your own mind and your own values, that you, you are not a creator. You are a, a destroyer. And so it's, a, yes. it's an, act of, an act of revelation there. So all of those people without fail have uh, received some measure of postmodern education. So whatever rationalizations they tell themselves that it's okay to go out and destroy, you might as well be a, a nihilist in, in some sort. But even more narrowly than that, there is this phenomenon within the art world of uh, young people who started off loving art, you know, they 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 love Van Gogh, they love Monet, they love uh, Michelangelo, and they're just in awe with uh, with uh, Leonardo da Vinci and all of the, mm. the great accomplishments, and they uh, they start off with great energy, starting to work on their own art, and of course sometimes they realize they don't have the talent, and uh, uh, you know one. Uh, to become the first uh, first rate artist, and a lot of people will absorb that in a healthy way to say, okay, so I can still love and admire great art and recognize that you know, maybe art will be an avocation for me, but I'm never going to be another Michelangelo or the next Victor Hugo or whatever, and I I go off and do something else in the art world. But there are people though for whom the realization that they are not going to be first rate becomes a poison. Right. And uh, uh, they uh, then say, in effect, I hate the gods, I hate the world, or I hate my parents for not giving me you know, the, the trip to Paris uh, and the trips to Florence when I was 12 so I could be, you know, start early enough. And, and, and to some extent, I hate myself because I have to realize that I am never going to be uh, living up to my childhood dreams. And so that becomes poisonous, and the way it, you, it comes out is an urge to destroy that thing that was your ideal in the first place. Mm. So if you think by analogy, this, and this happens a lot in art, you know, where they will, in a very angry way, lash out at other people who are being successful in their art and uh, destroy other works of art and obviously destroy their own work. Another example uh, in another domain, though, where the psychology becomes very apparent is if you think about love relationships, and pretty much all of us have gone through this, where you are infatuated with someone, 
you fall in love with this person and this person then in effect takes you to the mountaintops and beyond right physically and emotionally and intellectually and you then pin your entire hopes for your future on your life with this person you are totally in love and then that person dumps you mm. and then suddenly you are crashed into the depths of despair and it is still a very natural human psychological reaction then to hate that person to want to destroy everything that person has and even to destroy that person uh, and to hate anybody in your social circle who has a successful relationship, your other guy friend or a girlfriend shows up talking about this new person they met and how wonderful are you hate that person and you want to smack them right in the face and you start <laughs> telling yourself things like love is a myth, love is an illusion, I will never love again and you start to build these walls and to, to 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 undercut your own emotional capacity for or for love or any possible relationship so from the idealism of love to becoming a kind of destroyer from the idealism of art to becoming a kind of destroyer the same thing can happen in other intellectual domains people who start off rather idealistic uh, uh if they get in the hands of people who are effective nihilists they can, of course, themselves become extraordinarily resentful and nihilistic themselves. Mm. And I think that's the deepest danger of postmodernism. And I'll give you, uh, beautifully said, but just one more question before I let you go, because I know you've got things to do. Um, when I look at that, when I look at these works of art being vandalized, for example, I think that, yes, they're destroying the art and the thing that they couldn't actually physically achieve themselves or the idea of whatever it is that they couldn't achieve. But then I also think that there's another underlying demoralization of the people who who did the thing that they couldn't achieve as well. And you, you obviously touched on that just then. But when I look around Europe, when I'm in Budapest, when I'm in Rome, when I'm in Florence and these places, everything is so beautiful. And you can walk around and you can see history and tradition and you can almost smell it. It's so, it permeates everywhere. Hey, it's um, wonderful. It's yeah. fantastic. And then I'm from Australia, not the richest history in the world, but you know, it's beautiful in some ways. In a world where you constantly are, are seeing people around you and ideas around you that want to spit in the face of that tradition, that beauty, how does one stop themselves from becoming nihilistic themselves or demoralized? Well, yeah, the first thing you have to do is get out of that social environment. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, go back to teenagers as well. You know, we, uh, you know just one of the great themes in literature, and it's an important theme, is uh, parents uh, who have not accomplished much in their own lives and who are now middle-aged or older who realize that their lives have been a disappointment, that they are a failure, and how they raise their children. So when their children start to say, I want to be an artist, I want to start a new business, I want to explore the world, and so they are full of optimism and enthusiasm and dreams and plans. The kind of parent who undercuts that mm. says, you're nothing special. Right? Don't uh, think that you're going to amount to much. And uh, comes up with every single possible obstacle that that person's going to face, but sees every single obstacle as a defeater. And so you might as well give up now, kid. And of course, it'll be wrapped in, you know, I'm just trying to look out what's best for you, but really they are sabotaging the kids' uh, optimism, their romanticism, their idealism. And uh, that is a kind of sadism, uh, in my view, in, uh, in parenting in parenting style. And the only advice that you can give to, uh, to kids is get out of that household as, as soon as you possibly, as soon as you possibly can. So I would say the same thing if you are in a toxic work environment. Uh, there's lots of jobs out there or start your own job, become an entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, associate yourself with uh, with healthy people. If you are a student, you are at a at a university, of course, shop around. But uh, uh, those departments and programs that have uh, uh, an air of toxicity 
about them. Don't go there. Seek out the, the just like you seek out the healthiest food you possibly can. Seek out the healthiest professors and the healthiest uh, healthiest programs that you can find and uh, immerse yourself in in those. A fantastic piece of advice. And I want to give you a last special thank you for coming on. Mm. It's been a real honor. So I hope this is not the last time we get to talk. All right. Well, thanks a lot for uh, for the invitation, Jake. Uh, a, a real pleasure. Great questions too. Thank you. And obviously, where can everybody find you as well if they're looking to to find you? Well, on I do have my uh, my website, stephenhicks.org. Uh, um, but if you're at YouTube, I would recommend first for a lot of my my lectures and podcasts are uh, through my Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship. It's just C E E video channel and uh, much of my stuff. And we have lots of other good stuff there as well. I'll leave that all at the top of the comments and uh, pinned in the bio. Thank you so all much right. again. Thanks a lot, Jake.